Hello everyone. Welcome back to Foolish Engineer. The best microcontroller for a 48 volt BMS needs a balanced blend of performance, safety, connectivity and convenience. It should pick boxes for speed and memory, have the right communication and analog peripherals to make our life better as a developer. But you might be thinking, if the BMS IC that we saw last time is so smart, why do we even need a microcontroller? Well, that's exactly what we are going to see today. So let's start. One of the key reasons I started this YouTube channel is to bridge the gap between the outdated engine education system and actual skills needed in the industry. Well, if you are a student, you can use and learn an industry-leading EDS software, Ultium, for free by using its student lab program, which narrows down this gap. You just need to use your university email to enroll and you get a full student license, a full PCB design course, and a certificate recognized by top Indian core electronics industries. Ultium isn't just one PCB design software, but it is a whole platform of capabilities for electronics design. I've personally used Ultium since the start of my electronics journey, and I honestly recommend it. It's a fantastic way to enhance your skills and increase your chance of landing a job in a core electronics company. So don't miss this golden opportunity. First, a quick recap. A microcontroller is basically a tiny computer on a chip. It has a processor, some memory, and input-output peripherals, all integrated in one package. If you have played with an Arduino, you've already used a microcontroller. In a BMS, the MCU is the brain of the operation. It runs software that makes high-level decisions. Unlike the analog-focused BMS IC, the MCU is digital and programmable. We can code it to do whatever logic we need. Think of the microcontroller as the decision maker that can calculate numbers and communicate whereas the AFE is the specialist sensor that directly interfaces with the battery cells. They form a perfect complementary duo. Well, that's why we still need a microcontroller. Also, because sensing and reacting isn't the whole story. We also need thinking, planning, logging, and communicating. The BMS IC is great at what's happening right now, whereas the MCU handles what does that mean and what should we do about it? In a BMS, the microcontroller works with the BMS IC as a supervisor. If you remember our last BMS analogy, cells are students, BMS IC is the class monitor and MCU is the class teacher, who is actual decision maker of the BMS. The AFE measures and reports everything like each cell's behavior and can even take immediate actions if a rule is broken, like discorrecting an overcharged cell. The MCU listens to all these reports and decides higher level actions. It keeps notes, logs events, calls for help when needed like communicating with outer systems and ensures the BMS runs smoothly. The MCU doesn't replace the BMS's own actions. It simply organizes and manages them. While the BMS IC handles immediate cutoffs, the MCU is responsible for a broader protection strategy. For example, if the AFE triggers an overvoltage cutoff, the MCU will record that event, perhaps decide to keep the system off until a user does something about it or until voltage falls back in the range. The microcontroller can also add delay logic or multi-step decisions. Like if the pack is slightly over current, maybe just reduce the current by telling a motor controller to slow down. Rather than just cutting off immediately, the microcontroller takes the raw measurements like voltage, current, 
temperature from the AV and runs algorithms to estimate things like state of charge and state of health of the battery. Using this, the microcontroller can predict how exactly full the battery is and how much capacity it has lost over the time. The PMS IC provides the data, but it is the MCU that says we are at 75% charge or battery health is 90%. This usually involves complex calculations, which is good for a programmable microcontroller. The BMS IC definitely has the circuitry for bleeding cells, but when to balance and how long is decided by the MCU's logic. The MCU might periodically check cell voltages and then tell to AV, hey, these particular cells are a bit high. Bleed them for around 5 minutes. It can coordinate balancing with charging cycles. For example, only balance when the battery is idle or charging. And ensure we don't overheat cells by balancing too much. The MCU acts as the memory and historian of the BMS. Every event detected by the AFE, like an voltage, a fault or a disconnect, the MCU can log into its flash memory. Later on, we can retrieve this log to see if a particular cell has been frequently heating under voltage or if the pack had a sudden temperature spike. This is very important for diagnostics and improving the battery system over time. The BMS IC itself doesn't have the storage or complex key to do long-term logging. So the BMS steps in here. Perhaps this might be one of the most important roles. The MCU communicates with the outside world. In an e-bike or an electric car, the microcontroller will communicate with the other controllers or a dashboard. Maybe sending data over CAN bus, UART or other communication protocols. And the PMSIC is not capable of talking high-level protocols. It typically only speaks to the microcontroller. So the MCU translates the AFE's data into meaningful messages, like displaying battery's capacity or faulty cell alerts. With the microcontroller, the BMS can talk to the chargers, motor controllers, and even our smartphone app if needed. The MCU also handles any other tasks in the BMS, which AFE cannot do. It might control pre-charge circuit, drive a cooling fan or heater for the battery. Is the central coordinator that ensures all pieces of the system work together without any problem. In our e-bike BMS example, the BQ76972 BMS IC and a microcontroller together will form the complete BMS. Let's imagine a scenario. The battery is charging and during that time, the BMS IC might say to the microcontroller that a particular cell is above the limit and autonomously open the charge fed. The microcontroller hears that alert, locks that event and then perhaps sends a message to the charger or user interface saying the battery or voltage protection activated. Then the MCU might also decide to bleed a bit of charge from that particular cell using AFE's balancing control to bring it to the safety range. And one thing's normal, it could re-enable the charging. Now, when selecting a microcontroller for a 48 volt BMS, certain features and parameters become especially important. Here are the key things to consider. While BMS doesn't require a supercomputer, the MCU should have a decent clock speed and enough CPU to handle tasks like running state of charge calculations, balancing algorithms, and communication protocols smoothly. A faster code, for example, 50 MHz plus, will work perfectly here. It can take care of interrupts and make decisions in real time. Many 48 volt systems like e scooters or EVs communicate over CAN or similar robust protocols. A good microcontroller should have at least one CAN interface. Also, interfaces to talk to the BMS IC are important 
like SPI or I2C. Additionally, UARTs for debug or Bluetooth modules. Even though the most voltage and current sensing is taken care by a dedicated BMS IC, having some on-chip analog capability is useful. It can serve as a redundancy. For example, if the BMS ADC can measure total PAX voltage as a cross-check. This means chip is smart enough to catch its own mistakes. Imagine a MCU is writing notes in a notebook like battery voltages, currents, and temperatures. Now, what if a few words randomly disappear from that notebook? That's dangerous, right? The MCU might think the battery is cool, but actually it's overheating. To avoid this, we can use error-correcting code memory, kind of like autocorrect for data. If a bit flips by accident, which can happen due to electrical noise, ECC fixes it, before a BMS makes a bad decision. It also should have watchdog timers. Little timers that keep track of whether the MCU is still alive and running correctly. If the MCU gets stuck or crashes, the watchdog kicks in and resets the system. There are also like cyclic redundancy checkers. These are like digital bodyguards that make sure any data sent or received hasn't been tampered or corrupted on the way. Field updates for BMS firmware are like a necessity now to fix bugs or tweak battery algorithms over time. So it is also a good feature to have. The microcontroller should be fast and efficient. We want a microcontroller that can crank up the speed for active times, but also one can consume very less power when it is idle. BMS often needs to store calibration data, battery history, and fault logs. Some microcontrollers include a small EEPROM or emulated EEPROM area or simply a separate data flash bank for these purposes. This is a bit less about the MCO specs and more about our sanity as developers. A BMS project touches a lot of domains analog, digital, software, safety. So we want a microcontroller that comes with good documentation, software libraries, and tool support. A 48 volt BMS might live in an electric scooter zipping through winter cold and summer heat. An automotive microcontroller usually supports minus 40 degrees Celsius to 125 degrees Celsius operating range, which covers most of the scenarios so a BMS stays reliable throughout its life. I hope you understood why a microcontroller is important in BMS. And I also know it's actually a no-brainer to use it. But most of us just underestimate its value. If you found this video useful, give it a thumbs up. Hit subscribe button and stay tuned for more exciting content.